Welcome to Central Study Hour here at Sacramento Central Seventh Day Adventist Church. Wherever you may be watching, thank you so much for joining us today. Our first song will be hymn number 516, All the Way. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3. special song requests, please visit our website at sexcentral.org. Click on the contact us link and there you can go down to the hymn request site. Click on to that and give us your favorite hymn and remember to leave your name, the country or the state you're from and the title of the hymn and we'll be happy to sing it with you on an upcoming Sabbath. For our next song, we'll sing hymn number 518. Standing on the promises. Oh, how we need to stand on his promises in days like this. In the end time, uh, we pray that God will help us to stand on those promises. Let's sing together one, two, and three. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Standing on the promises of God 
Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you'll help us to be firm on your promises, not to let the things around us discourage us, um, not to let the enemy have his way in our hearts. I pray that you will take over, uh, help us to believe and trust in you in these final days of that we're given on this earth. We ask that the Holy, Holy Spirit will be with us today in a special way. Draw us close to your side and help us to see a picture of Jesus today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Sabbath school lesson will be presented by Pastor Chris Buttery, Senior Pastor here at Sac Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Oh, good morning. Good to see you all again. And uh, beautiful, rousing songs we got to sing this morning. Happy Sabbath, Mike. That's right. Good to see everyone and glad you're uh, here as we gather together to study God's Word. And those that are tuning in, we are also glad that you're doing so. Uh, we always have a free offer for you. And today's offer is C22002. Call 916-457-6511. Or email us at csh at sexcentral.org and we'll be happy to get that free offer out to you. Ask for CD or DVD and give us your full address. And this is for those in North American territories. Uh, you'll also, uh, when you go to our website, you'll notice the website's a little different. We don't have the CSH banner up, up at the top like we usually do. It's kind of in the middle of the page. And you'll notice there are there's an opportunity there for you to ask Bible questions. So submit your Bible questions and also a link to submit your hymn requests. All in one place, easy to find. And of course, if you need a copy of the study guide, uh, you can uh, access that there as well. Glad, glad to be able to provide that for all of you. We're in the book of Daniel, and uh, it's uh, just exciting to be studying this prophetic book together. And uh, I understand, and uh, maybe you've experienced this yourself as well, that when the books of Daniel and Revelation are studied together, it has the potential to generate a revival in our lives and in the revival of the, a revival in the church. And uh, we're in lesson number two today, and uh, the lesson title is From Jerusalem to Babylon, and we're going to be in Daniel chapter 1, and the memory text is Daniel chapter 1 verse 17, and notice what it says. It says, as for the, these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. There is no question as we review the lesson today that God blessed Daniel and his compatriots, his three friends. And it's important to realize when we're looking at this story that Daniel and his friends are the ones that are highlighted because there were other uh, young Jewish boys that were brought to uh, Babylon from Jerusalem. But these young men were highlighted because these were the ones that appear to have been to remain faithful to the Lord. And um, Daniel Daniel was, uh, according to the spirit of prophecy, about 18 years of age when he was taken from Babylon, uh, from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon. Now, one thing is certain when we read the Bible, uh, and that is that it is not, God is not afraid to share some of the uh, negative characteristics of some of the characters of the Bible. Um, it's certainly very clear that uh, God is not afraid to show uh, humanity, that humanity is frail and weak and uh, certainly is in need of uh, divine help. But uh, also the Bible reveals uh, stories of individuals who remain faithful, who are faithful to God, and, um, and by thus doing so, being faithful to God, glorify God in their lives. Um, ultimately, the faithfulness of an individual testifies to the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God. And that's an important point to keep in mind. It's not as if Daniel and his friends are the heroes in the story. The hero in the story, always the hero in the story, is Christ. Always the hero in the story is God. And, um, and the faithfulness of an individual testifies to the faithfulness of God. Uh, we go to this, if you go to the story of Job, it's pretty clear that Job's faithfulness answered the accusations that the, that the devil made against God. And uh, so Job's faithfulness didn't prop Job up as being the hero, it propped God up as being the hero. And uh, we always need to keep that in mind. When we look at the book of Daniel, Daniel essentially is a book that's in, written in two parts. You have uh, story and you have prophecy. 
And uh, we can't say it's neatly divided because it, uh, when you get to chapter 2 of Daniel, there's 12 chapters. When you get to chapter 2 of Daniel, you've got your first prophecy. But chapter 1, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are primarily uh, our story. Um, and so what does this tell us about the book of Daniel? Prophecy teaches us where we are in the stream of time, tells us where we are in time. Then what do the stories, what are they designed to do? The stories are designed to teach us how to live in the time in which we are, okay? So uh, as we review these stories, um, they're as equally important to the prophecies that we'll be studying in the book of Daniel because the stories teach us how we ought to live for God during troubling, difficult, challenging times. Um, by the way, if it wasn't mentioned before, I'll mention it here today too. When Jesus was talking about or, or sharing signs of the last days, we read that in Matthew 24 and then in Luke chapter 21. There was a particular book of the Bible that Jesus encouraged his people living in the last days to read. Do you remember what book that was? It's, yeah, Daniel, the book of Daniel. Chapter, if you look at Matthew 24, verse 15, uh, Jesus encourages uh, his people to review and to be familiar with and understand the prophecies, the story of Daniel. And it's the only one he encourages us to read. Not, not to suggest that others shouldn't be read, um, but he's, uh, in mentioning it, he's, uh, he is indicating the importance of the book of Daniel and to spend time in it. And so here we are uh, living in the toenails of time, living in the last days, and we're encouraged to read the book of Daniel. And so here we are reading and studying the book of Daniel together. And uh, certainly there is some, uh, some things in here that are going to help us and bless us and encourage us uh, and ch even challenge us in our walk with the Lord. So let's go over to Sunday's lesson. We'll begin um, with Sunday's lesson, of course, God's sovereignty. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 1, and we want to read verses 1 and 2 together. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, that is Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God." So the book of Daniel begins with actually with tragedy, uh, with this very sad picture of God's people being led into captivity um, uh, at the hand of a pagan nation. And um, it is during the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim. King Jehoiakim, if you recall, is the first of the last three kings of the kingdom of Judah. By this time, the 10 northern tribes, it, known as Israel, um, had been, uh, had been uh, essentially dispersed by the kingdom of Assyria, and they no longer existed. And the only remaining vestiges of God's people was the tribes of J Benjamin and Judah, known as Judah. Uh, but when you read in the book of Daniel, the reference to Judah and Israel, it's really just a reference to the remaining two tribes, which is Judah, Judah and Benjamin. And so this is Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was, um, Jehoiakim was a, one of the sons of Josiah, the pr previous king. And Je Jehoiakim, uh, he ruled and he didn't do so well. And his uh, brother Jehoiachin uh, took over and he didn't do so well. And then, uh, then the last king was, if I'm not mistaken, am I going to get it right? Zedekiah. He was the last king and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and uh, ultimately brought about the demise of Jerusalem. So Jehoiakim is the last of the three, the last of the three um, uh, kings of Judah. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things for us here, because there were three uh, different times that the Babylonians, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in particular, came in to um, ransack, to, uh, to deport the children of Judah and take them to Babylon. The first was, of course, in 605 BC, what we're reading here today, what we're, what we're looking at here, the book of Daniel. And then, of course, we have 597 BC, uh, where uh, uh, where Jehoiakim had uh, brought about, come into political alliance with Egypt, 
And uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah for the second time, deporting another chunk of the population. In that second uh, deportation, Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, was taken to Babylon. And then it was in 586 BC under Zedekiah, uh, because he would not uh, listen to the appeals of Jeremiah, because he uh, did contrary to God's will, um, that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar came in to punish uh, Zedekiah, and it was in that incursion and deportation that uh, the temple was destroyed. All the f- uh, all the remaining vestiges of the temple, all the instruments and so on, were taken out, and only the poor uh, essentially were left in the land. Uh, so uh, Jerusalem had some real problems, and the problems uh, didn't come about because uh, God willed it to be so, or or just because Babylon was a mighty power of that time. There's other things that are going on. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So this is the story. Jehoiakim is the first of the last three kings of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and Jerusalem is besieged. And of course, this is where a kingdom or an army will surround a city and essentially starve that city into submission. It's a very cruel way to bring about the demise of a city. And so that's what, uh, that's what they did. And when, you, uh, when, you, when we talk about the land of Shinar, probably, um, probably something comes to mind the first time that Shinar is mentioned in the Bible. If you go back to, uh, back to Genesis chapter 11, verse 2, what was built in the land of Shinar? That was a really an edifice uh, declaring the uh, defiant, rebellious spirit of the people back then, the Tower of Babel. It was built there in the land of Shinar. And while, uh, while they were not victorious in building that, uh, that, that tower, uh, that tower erected defying the God of heaven, um, here you have those living in the land of Shinar, Babylon, now seeming to be victorious over God and his people uh, and the covenant that he's established with them. And so this, is, uh, this seems like a defeat, and yet there is more to the story. The other thing I want to bring out here too, the other thing I want to bring out here too is you have two, two kingdoms mentioned in the book of Daniel at the very beginning. You've got Jerusalem, which really is the city of God. It's really the city of God. God's name is there. And you also have another city, Babylon. Babylon, the, uh, where the, the, at the base, at the foundation of its structure is, is paganism and the worship of false gods. And so here you've got essentially a battle between God's people and the enemy of God's people. And this theme, and it's important to understand, this theme runs all throughout the book of Daniel in a worldwide spiritual sense. Uh, when you get to the book of Revelation, of course, uh, you notice that there are, Jerusalem is mentioned again, but it's called the New Jerusalem. Uh, you have Israel mentioned, but it's spiritual Israel, those who have faith in Christ. And then you have also Babylon mentioned, the, uh, that great city, the harlot, the one who is causing all nations, the kings of the earth, to, uh, to be intoxicated with the wine of her fornication. So you have the two powers struggling again in the last days. Essentially, at the, at the, uh, behind the scenes, you have the struggle between Christ and Satan. And so you see this as you, as you begin the book of Daniel. And it's an important thing to keep in mind as we, as we study it uh, together. So was the defeat of Jerusalem, did it come about through the, the, uh, the, the strength and might of Babylon? Or did it come about uh, because God strictly willed it? What was going on here? What does it say there in verse 2? Verse 2 reminds us that it was the Lord who gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. So why did the Lord allow this to happen? There has to be a valid reason, doesn't there? Is God not careful to protect his people? Does he care less what happens to his people, what takes place there in Jerusalem? No, he cares greatly. He cares uh, a lot. As a matter of fact, let's go down to the middle of, the, of Sunday's lesson. And there are several Bible verses listed here. We'll take a look at a couple of them. And uh, let's go to 2 Kings. This kind of this gives us a clue, gives us, helps us understand what's going on, why God gave Jerusalem into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. 2 Kings, and we're going to chapter 21 and verse uh, 10 through 16. 2 Kings 10 through 16. This is really the story of Manasseh. And of course, he, according to verse 11, 
Uh, he, had, uh, he was the king of Judah and he'd done these abominations. He acted more wickedly than all the Amorites, the, the pagan nations around Judah. Therefore the Lord said of Israel, Behold, I'm bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears it, both his ears will tingle. And I'll stretch over Jerusalem the plummet line of Samaria, the plummet of the house of A. I'm going to measure Judah by these other nations. And, uh, and I will wipe Jerusalem. You ever wiped a dish before? You wipe the front, drying it, and then you turn it over and you dry away. Well, you before you dry, you've got to clean the dish. So you scrub that dish on the front, you scrub the dish on the behind, and God says he's going he's gonna di- to wash Jerusalem like we would scrub a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. Verse 14, verse 15, Why? Because they have done evil in my sight and have provoked me in the end to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt. Verse 16, moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood, a lot of innocent blood, till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other beside his sin by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of God. Now we could look at the others, Second Kings 24. Let's take it, just go over there a couple of pages. Verses 18 to uh, 20. And this speaks about Zedekiah, the last king of, of Judah. 2 Kings 24, 18 to 20. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out of his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So uh, Jeremiah 3.13, we won't go there, but Jeremiah 3.13 talks about idolatry that was rampant among the, God's people. Jeremiah 17, uh, they had a real big problem with keeping the Sabbath. Uh, if we were to talk about two major reasons why uh, God allowed Jerusalem to be taken over by the, the Babylonians uh, is be, uh, because of idolatry, number one, and Sabbath breaking, number two. Those are the primary reasons. Uh, and of course, they came from rebellious hearts. Uh, I, made a, I made a note of some of the things in reading these verses and other verses that correspond and relate to Judah's demise and why God allowed them into the hands of the Babylonians. Stubborn rebellion, idol worship, Sabbath desecration, talked about those. And then, of course, we read in 2 Kings 21, Manasseh, the shedding of a lot of innocent blood. They, did God... Did God send them a warning? <laughs> did he warn them about their behavior, their recalcitrance? Did he offer them a way out? Over and over and over again. Who was the main prophet that warned uh, Judah about what would happen if they remained uh, obstinate and defiant? It was Jeremiah. Yeah, so the whole book of Jeremiah is, is God's really, his appeal to Judah to repent and turn back to, to God. Now we're talking in general because of course inside of Jerusalem and in Judah, there were faithful followers of his. And unfortunately they had to, uh, uh, they were uh, and, and had to suffer the consequences of the poor behavior and performance and attitude of the rebels in Judah. And so they didn't heed the warning. God had sent many times had sent messages to warn Judah, but they didn't listen. They didn't want to uh, accept what God was saying. And so if a person rejects God, God is a gentleman and he steps back. And in his great providence and his sovereignty, he allows certain things to take place, uh, part of his, uh, his, his sovereign will, that in an attempt to bring his people back to him. Because as has been said before, we are hard nuts to crack. Humanity is very stubborn. And sometimes extreme uh, situations call for extreme measures. It wasn't as if God hadn't warned them. Babylon's going to come. He'd named them. As a matter of fact, if you go back to uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 39, verses 6 and 7, we may look at that in a minute. But even Isaiah, 100 years before this happened, had predicted exact things that were taking place. The exact things that were taking place. As a matter of fact, no, we'll go there in a minute. We'll go there. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. And so God was wanting to wake them up. He wanted to, he wanted to help them recognize their dependence upon him and that only he and he alone could help them and, uh, and could bless them. Uh, and uh, his way, of course, is the better way, not their own way. Their own way would bring about tragic and sad results and bring about a difficult, difficult time for them. But God's ways... God's ways are better ways. 
And so God is trying to stir his people. And so what we see here is that God, as the author says at the bottom of the page, uh, that God, the God whom we serve, not only drives the forces of history through his sovereignty, so God certainly is, dri- is, is driving the force of history through his sovereignty, but he also will mercifully intervene for his people, which we'll see as we continue, even in Daniel 1, um, as he intervenes for his people in, in Babylon at that particular time. Um, and I think that's an important point to keep in mind. God is the one who sets up kings, take king, takes kings down. He, he's, in his sovereignty, God is the one who sees it all, knows it all, and is ordering things for the betterment of his people and for his will, and in, in, in particularly, so that people would come to understand and accept the everlasting gospel. Now, God's sovereignty never, uh, never interferes with our ability to choose. And never. The, these are, these are the freedom, uh, choice, freedom of choice, uh, f- uh, free human will and God's sovereignty uh, are to be kept in healthy tension to each other. These are two truths within the scripture that are not in conflict with each other. And we need to certainly keep that in mind. So God is sovereign. And I think it's important for us, no matter what we might be going through, that God, uh, God has our best interest at heart even while we might even be rebelling against him. Did he have Jerusalem's best interest at heart when Babylon came in? He certainly did. He, he didn't, there was no other way. There was no other, if there was another way, you can be sure God would have figured out another way, a less uh, difficult, challenging way. But because the people had made it so difficult for God, God could only resort to these methods. Um, short of just wiping them out completely and starting with a new people. And he didn't want to do that because he loved them. And uh, he made a promise to, uh, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And he was a, he's a, God is a covenant keeping God, even though we, and Moses, thank you. And even though, even though we might break the covenant from time to time, but keep in mind, God is sovereign. He's ordering things. He, when we see problems and challenges in this country in, in broader scales, even in your own, God has your best interest at heart. And, uh, and that we can, we, can, uh, we can rely on. Let's go to Monday's lesson. Let's continue our reading in Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar comes in. He's the uh, king of Babylon at the time. And apparently at this time, according to history, he was a relatively new king. His father had uh, one, uh, one version of the story goes that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was out there doing these particular things. And while he was out, his father died. He had to come back to make sure that no one took the throne that he was entitled to. And uh, then he came back to finish what he had, uh, was doing here uh, in, uh, in this region. Um, so he was a relatively new king, um, uh, according to some accounts. And of course, uh, we read verse 2. Uh, he took Joe, uh, some of the uh, treasures. And verse 3, now notice verse 3. Then, then the king instructed Asphanaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Now, what type of individuals is he, is he asked to bring from Jerusalem? The cream of the crop, isn't he? Yeah. Verse 4, young men in whom there was no blemish, good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Let's continue reading. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So there were others that were taken, but the four are highlighted as we read the rest of the story. These four were faithful to God under under the circumstances they were put in. And so uh, Monday's lesson, faith under pressure, faith under pressure. We have to understand that when Asphanaz was told to do this and these young men were taken from their home to Babylon, that essentially they were brought to the courts to be brainwashed the smartest, the most popular, the most prized youth. And of course, when you get those youth, those youth can influence the other youth, right? So the idea was to bring them in to brainwash them and, uh, and, to, and the education given, them, given to them was essentially to change them. They were to be reborn as Babylonians. That's really the, the, the essence of what's happening here. The effect of this would be conversion, would be indoctrination. 
and the result would be a change in their world view. The whole purpose of this re-education process of the young people was to change their world view so that they would be, uh, they would be subjects of, of uh, loyal subjects of the king of Babylon. Now, um, now, now they may be, uh, to some extent, um, something else at play here because the Assyrians kind of did this I'm not sure in, in its entirety whether King Nebuchadnezzar did this, but oftentimes uh, the young people would be taken in, they would be trained and, and, and uh, brainwashed, and then they would be sent back to where they came from to be puppet rulers for the dominating king. And when they would send them back to be puppet rulers, of course, they would exert their influence and lead uh, the, 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 the conquered nation uh, to become subservient to and to imbibe the teachings and doctrines of that particular ruling power. If you think about, for example, uh, in the Soviet, the, when the Soviet Union, the Soviet uh, Empire um, went into Afghanistan, do you remember what they did? They took the youth, didn't they? They took the youth, they brought some of the youth of Af the Afghani youth, they took them back they're in, back into Russia and they educated these young Afghani youth in the teachings of Marxism and communism and then they sent them back to be puppet rulers. Um, Hitler did the same thing, didn't he? I think it was Hitler that said, give me, give me the youth of Germany, give me Germany. He knew the power and influence of, of indoctrinating young, young minds. And, uh, and so when he overran some of the countries in Europe, he brought some of them back, taught them Nazism and sent them back to be puppet rulers. And so that the, his teaching and doctrine would permeate uh, and infiltrate uh, those countries. And so maybe in Babylon, maybe this was a part of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's strategy, but one thing is certain, the whole idea was to, to change their worldview because their worldview wasn't healthy and safe as far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned in his kingdom. So what were, what was, what were the uh, areas in which they were re-educated? There were four areas, weren't there? First of all, they were given a, according to what we read, they were given a new, uh, they were given a new language to, 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 to speak. They were taught a new language. They were, also, they were also going to be given new literature to read. Okay. And what's the other thing that, that happened, part of the re-educating process? They were given a new name, and we haven't read that yet, but they were given a new, new name, and they were also given a new lifestyle, diet, exactly. So these are the four areas that Nebuchadnezzar used to re-educate the youth of Jerusalem. And, uh, and I just want to uh, pick something up here. When we talk about language and literature, um, the Babylonian, we have some information regarding the, the ancient Babylonian education system. And so there were two stages that, the, that, that uh, they would... Uh, have the young people work through as they were educated. We're not in entirely sure whether this is the way Daniel and his friends were educated, but we have a glimpse of how they uh, uh, educated their young people. The, the first stage of Babylonian ed education inclu included the learning of two major languages um, common to the Babylonians. The first was Aramaic. That was their primary language, literary language. Oh, sorry, their international language at the time. And that was the primary language. And the other language they were taught was Akkadian language, which was a literary language used to convey religious and cultural traditions of the empire. And the Akkadian, uh, Akkadian language, or Akkadian required the mastery of some complex cuneiform uh, writing system with hundreds of characters. And so it's very likely Daniel uh, and his three friends and the other children that uh, were taken out of Israel, the youth that were taken out of Israel, uh, had to learn these two languages and all this cuneiform. That's the first stage. The second stage, they were introduced to more Babylonian texts uh, to try to develop in them the worldview of Babylon. And, uh, and so uh, essentially they would fill the mind, student's mind with theological and political ideology that was current uh, at the time. And so that was the new language and new literature, and they were going to be immersed in that. And uh, of course, what does that, what, what, the, old, the idea here, when we talk about new language and new literature, essentially, uh, I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar wanted to see, wanted these young people to forget their old way of life. This, this, is, this is part of that indoctrination, that, uh, that brainwashing to forget the old way of life. When they were given a new diet to eat, this was to, this was to cause them to forget their old lifestyle, their old way of life as well. 
And then the name change. Did we read the name change? Let's go to Daniel chapter 1, verse 7. We didn't finish verse, uh, the reading. So here we had the, three, the four Hebrew boys listed, and the chief of the eunuchs, verse 7, gave them names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar to Hananiah, Shadrach to Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. So essentially, he was giving them a new identity. Names, the names of children given by their parents in that culture at that time reflected the characteristics or the future that the parents wanted for that child. So the names of the children was, imp- was huge. So every time Daniel heard his name, Daniel, time for dinner, God is my judge. That's what Daniel meant. God is my judge. That's every time, uh, every time Daniel's name was called. And here he is in Babylon where Nebuchadnezzar has taken him and his friends from their home to a foreign nation to be servants of the king. Daniel could remember God is my judge. He will set things right eventually. But Nebuchadnezzar couldn't have that, so he changed his name. And he changed his name to Belteshazzar, which meant keeper of the hidden treasures of Bel Marduk or Marduk. That's uh, one of the, or the prominent uh, god of the 13 gods of ancient Babylon, Bel Marduk. And you remember, uh, they went in, we read in verse 2, they went in, they took some of, the, uh, some of the instruments from the temple, the house of God, and they brought it to their temple, where Bel, they served and worshipped Bel Marduk or Bel Marduk. And so Belshazzar meant now he was the keeper of the hidden treasures of Bel. No longer is God your judge, but you're the keeper of the hidden treasures of our God. And then Hananiah, he was given the name Shadrach. Hananiah, what did Hananiah mean? Hananiah meant the Lord is gracious to me, or the Lord is gracious. And so every time Hananiah had his name called, Hananiah, time for dinner, he was reminded, the Lord is gracious to me. Whether he had riches or whether he was poor, whether he was home in Jerusalem or whether he was in Babylon, the Lord is gracious to me. But of course, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't have that, so he changed his name to Shadrach, which meant inspiration of the sun. No longer is the Lord gracious to you, but the sun shines on you and is gracious to you. And then uh, Mishael, Mishael, and whenever you have E-L in the name of a, uh, of, uh, of a name, E-L in the, in the midst of a name or at the end of a name, it, it's a reference to God. And so Mishael, we could say, uh, is like God or, or God-like. And uh, his name was changed to Meshach, who now would be the servant of the goddess of Sheba. Um, and then Azariah, his name was the Lord is my helper, what a great name. Every time you hear your name, hey, uh, Azariah, what's going on today? The Lord is my helper. Hey, how are you going to do on your exams today? Azariah, the Lord is my helper. Hey, we're in Babylon. We're far from home in this strange f- place. Azariah, the Lord is my helper. Amen. The Lord is my helper. But Nebuchadnezzar couldn't have that, so he changed it to Abednego, the servant of Nego one of the gods of Babylon. And so this was a complete, a, pl- a complete change in identity. And Nebuchadnezzar was serious about changing the thoughts, the actions, the behaviors, the habits, the identity of these young men. Didn't want to trace them to remember where they came from. Didn't want to trace of anything from where they came in his kingdom. He wanted them solely his, subjected to him. Question for you. Question for you. How, how did Daniel and his three friends, how did, they, how did they get past this idea that God would allow his people, and here these were innocent bystanders, taken into Babylonian captivity, away from family, away from friends, away from everything familiar. How did they remain so faithful to a God who would allow that? Well, they, they, they knew a few things, I think. Didn't they know a few things? They must have known a few things. They had trust in God, that God knew what he was doing. But what was their faith resting upon? God's word. God's word. Had not God warned Israel over and over again? As a matter of fact, go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 39. Isaiah is Isaiah. You know that now. Isaiah chapter 39, verses 6 and 7. Notice a hundred years before this took place, God gave this message to Isaiah. 
Notice. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. hundred years before this happened, God warned uh, the king, and at the time it was King Hezekiah, he had warned him that what you see here today, all these riches, all, this, all, this one, all these wonderful things here, one day it's all going to be taken out. And notice, this, the prophecy gets more specific, verse 7. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from the woman who will beget, and they shall be what? Eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Do you think Daniel was familiar with the words of the prophets? Yeah, and, this, and friends, this is the key this is one of the keys to success in any adverse, challenging, difficult circumstance. And that's knowing God's word, knowing his promises, knowing that he's in control. Now, this isn't so much a promise as it is a prophecy. But he knew, he knew the prophecy. He knew, the, he knew what God had intended. He knew the prophet, uh, you know, he very likely heard Jeremiah. And all the warnings that he'd given, and he knew that God was still leading his people. He had predicted it. By the way, um, Jeremiah said this gonna, captivity is going to happen, but what did also God tell his people through Jeremiah? At the, it last, captivity will only last how long? 70 years. So at the end of the 70 years, someone's going to be raised up. His name was Cyrus. He's going to be raised up. Isaiah prophesied, uh, God prophesied through Isaiah, said I, Cyrus is going to be the liberator of God's people. 70 years. And he's going to liberate uh, God's people, bring them out of Babylon, Persia, which became Persia, uh, part of the Persian Empire, and take them back to Jerusalem. So do you think Daniel and his friends knew that as well? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. So he knew the promises, he knew the prophecy, and he trusted God in these. So he didn't see God as being vindictive or being mean-spirited or forsaking his people. He saw this was a part of God's plan. And, and, uh, and sometimes, well, no, I shouldn't say sometimes, it's important that we gain a proper worldview today of things happening around us so that we can remain faithful to God as well during difficult and adverse circumstances. When you see things going this way and that way and things are strange, we understand God's still at work. We have the prophecies. We have the promises. He's doing all things well for his people. Jesus is coming soon. Things are going to happen. Uh, prophecies are very clear. So we have this, these thoughts in our mind that help us to remain faithful to God, even the most difficult, trying circumstances. When everyone else around us is confused and not understanding, we know this book, and we know the God of the book, and we trust in Him. Amen. Yeah. So is there a way that these boys could have rationalized their decision to compromise their faith? Uh, the, there's a question um, on, in Friday's lesson, page t uh, question number two on page, in my book is page 24. But in Friday's lesson, there's a question, question number two. It said, think about how easy it would have been for Daniel and the others to be conquered, to have, con sorry, compromised their faith. After all the Babylonians were the conquerors, the Jewish nation had been defeated. What more proof, quote unquote, was needed that the Babylonian gods, quote unquote, were greater than the God of Israel. And thus Daniel and his companions needed to accept that fact. In this case, what important biblical truths might have held, they might have held on to that helped sustain them during this time? What should this tell us about how important it is to know our Bibles and understand present truth? Of course, we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the Bible verses, and there's some more here you can read and be familiar with. But how easy would it have been? Israel is no more. Taken, subjugated, taken to Babylon. So now I'm in Babylon, and I might as well do as the Babylonians. Wouldn't it have been easy just to rationalize? I'm in this workplace, people have got foul language, they're, they talk filthy, dirty, um, uh, their minds are not on God or heavenly things. This is where I have to be eight hours, ten hours a day. Well, I might as well just drop my guard, I can't fight this, just might as well just be like them. Human nature has a great way of rationalizing and seeking ways to compromise to make our lives easier. We, we, tend to, we tend to take the path of least resistance. But God is calling us to be faithful, to have backbone, to be faithful under adverse trying circumstances, no matter what. No matter what. And Daniel and his friends stood firm for God. Firm resolution. Let's go to Tuesday while we're talking about that. Let's look at verses 8 through 16. By the way, what's going on here? There's a battle going on. There's a battle raging for 
For what? For the minds of Daniel and his friends. The devil wants Daniel's mind. And uh, certainly Daniel couldn't change the name change. He couldn't change his circumstances. But one thing he could do, he could choose his God and remain faithful to him. And so notice Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 to 16. It says, but Daniel, he purposed in his heart. He decided. He was resolute in his convictions. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Verse 9. Now notice, there are two, there are two ingredients for success. And we've just read one. This is the second one. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your face looking worse than the young men who are your age? I mean, I have to give you your food. This is my orders. And if you end up looking worse off for not taking it, then I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going to be held accountable. Then you would endanger my head before the king. Verse 11. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over him, Melzar. The King James mentions Melzar. Melzar seems more to be a title than a name. Uh, more so a title than a name. He is a steward of the chiefs of the eunuchs because, because, uh, uh, because the chief of the eunuchs couldn't be persuaded. Daniel spoke with the steward who had been set over Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Verse 12, he said, please test your servants for 10 days. And let them give us vegetables to eat, water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. As you see fit, so deal with your servants. So what did he do? He consented. He consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. The King James says pulse. That would really just mean, uh, the, the, in the original language, it means plant food. So it would be, it would be grains and vegetables and uh, would also include berries and water, of course, to drink. So that's the diet that Daniel and his friends pulse. Vegetables, berries, grains. This is the diet he asked for. And so he remained resolute and firm. And what then is the secret to life's battles? There are two things we read, in one in verse 8 and one in verse 9. The secret to life's battles is, the, is one is the power to choose the right. Having firm convictions, standing by what is right. And then the second is, did you read that in verse 9? What is it? God's intervention. God's intervention. And, I, and Ellen White says it so well. The secret of success in the Christian life is, uh, is, the, uh, is the, um, the secret of success in the Christian life is the combining of human power, human effort with divine power. That's the success. That's where success comes from. We do our part and pray as if it all depends on God. And then we pray as if it all depends on God and do everything as though it depended on us. That's the, the secret of success combination, the union of divine power. There it is, union of divine power and, uh, and uh, divine power and human effort. So what were the reasons Daniel chose not to eat the, the king's food and his delicacies? What were the reasons? Well, there, the, the lesson gives two likely reasons and probably there are more. Uh, the first reason is it's very likely that the meat that was presented before Daniel included unclean meat. And uh, as a good follower of Jehovah, God, uh, he was raised in a home where they did not eat unclean, unclean meats, uh, like, uh, like pork and camel and uh, vulture and mouse and, um, and uh, any uh, lobsters and crabs and those types of things. And so uh, it's very likely certain foods were brought to them that they had been raised not to eat because God had said, this is unfit for food. And so based on that, they said no. And that was another reason. Very likely, uh, the food that had been offered to them was rich and fattening. And Daniel and his friends uh, lived lives of strict temperance. And uh, by the way, this all speaks to their upbringing. Uh, one, day, one day, I think we're going to meet Daniel's folks. And I'm looking forward to that day. Daniel, and not only Daniel, but also his three friends, their parents, they raised these boys right. They knew that if we raise them from this age right, 
then they will do right always. If they have faith and confidence in God. And so they raised them right. And so they lived lives of strict temperance. And so the food was not fit for food. It was, it was rich. And I'm going to use the word pastries, even though I don't want to use the word pastries because I like pastries. But it was rich foods and things that weren't fit for. And by the way, they had just traveled many, many miles from Jerusalem. They had to go up and then they had to come down to Babylon. Many, many miles. And so they chose, they wanted to choose food that would help rebuild them and replenish them and help them to be all the best they could be for God. Not necessarily the king, but for God. So that's probably another reason. Another reason they probably didn't eat from the king's table is because uh, the food before it was served had been offered to idols. That was a pagan tradition and something that they uh, did. And, um, and we're also told in the spirit of prophecy that uh, Daniel and his friends were vegetarian, so they would not eat any meat products at all, um, which, of course, takes us back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, where God uh, delineates for us the original diet, the Edenic diet, which was fruits and grains and nuts and um, those types of things and vegetables, it seems, came a little later after the fall. And, um, but those are the foods that God gave our original parents and Daniel and his friends ate those types of foods. They were the best types of foods. Now, God has a permissible diet, doesn't he? If you're going to eat meat, eat it clean. But he has the ideal diet, which is what? No meat. Yeah, no meat. And we're not just talking about red meat, we're talking about white meat. So fish and chicken and those types of things too. So that's the ideal diet. And, and God's people ought to be moving in that direction. And we have very good cause for doing so because things are becoming more polluted. Things are becoming uh, corrupted and um, diseased. Thank you. I'm struggling to find that word. Thank you, Roy. I'm glad you're here today. Sorry. <laughs> Always glad you're here. Um, disease. So we've got good motivation to uh, consider an alternate diet and start moving in that direction. Not, not, that, not that vegetarianism saves you. Not that it's the gospel. No, no, no. Who saves you? Jesus does. But... Um, but our bodies are to be a living sacrifice, right? We're to, we're to present ourselves to God a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God and, uh, and give ourselves for him. And so God wants the best for us. He's given us, uh, he's given us his plan. And so that's what, those are probably the reasons why Daniel and his friends said no, we'd rather not. But I want you to notice they were respectful. They were firm, but they were respectful. They understood the dilemma that the chief of the eunuchs was in. So they proposed a test. And what does the Bible say? By the end of the 10 days... They appeared fairer and fatter. The other boys were eating what the king had provided that wasn't good to enrich their body, to restore their body from after that long, hard, arduous journey. They knew what foods they should eat to help them and to keep their minds clear and sharp because this is the only way God has to communicate with us, right? It's through the mind. So I would, su I would suggest too that they knew that in order to be faithful in the larger things, one has to be faithful in the smaller. If they knew if they compromised in this one area that to many seems insignificant, Daniel and his friends knew that if they compromised here, it'd be harder for them to stand firm and strong in other areas. Because once you compromise your convictions once, then it's easy to do it again and again and again until you're at a point where you don't know how you arrived there and you've apostatized, fallen away completely. There's several Bible verses they offer here in the lesson uh, to help us answer the question how we can remain faithful and true under adverse, difficult, trying circumstances, much like Daniel was, was in and his three friends. And I summarize those, sur surrendering to God, having self being crucified, denying self, living for God, and keeping, keeping heaven in view. Because the afflictions of the present are nothing to be compared with the glory that God has prepared for us. So I'm sure Daniel kept that in mind, and we should keep that in mind too. Does God honor those who are loyal to him? He does. He honors those that are loyal to him. And the story uh, essentially closes in verse 20, where Nebuchadnezzar tests them, uh, uh, gives them some exams, and he recognizes that Daniel and his three friends uh, were 10 times better than all the other wise men in in Israel. They applied themselves. By the way, it wasn't just their diet that the diet didn't make them smart, but it aided in their smartness. Their minds were clearer. They weren't just weren't clouded 
They applied themselves to education. They applied themselves in the best way they possibly could to be all that they could for God. And they stood firm and true. And they stood head and shoulders above everyone else, not just in their education, but also in their characters. Man, what a wonderful thing. And uh, the Bible says that they were given wisdom. And if you and I want to be successful in our Christian walk today, especially in these adverse circumstances, we need to be wise wise unto God. As a matter of fact, Daniel 12, 3 talks about in the last days, there'll be those who will shine like light lights, stars, they'll be wise. Do you want to be wise today? I want to be wise. Certainly, certainly. So in Daniel 1, we learn a couple of things. Here they are. Number one, God is in control of history. Number two, God will give us what we need, wisdom and grace, so that we can stand firm and true for God and be all that he wants us to be in this world. And number three, God honors those who trust in him. God honors those who stand by and stand firmly upon truth, stand by their convictions, who live according to their conscience. He'll bless them, he'll, he'll, he'll help them, he'll intervene for them and aid them. And these are the lessons that we can apply to our lives today. What do you say? Sure, by God's grace, by God's grace. Thank you for being a part of the study today. And those that have tuned in, glad you were able to do so also, whether you tuned in via 3 ABM Proclaim or First Light TV or our website, our YouTube channel, we're just glad you joined us. Don't forget the free offer. It's offer C22002, that is 22002C22002. Uh, call, to receive that, call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sackcentral.org. We'll get that out to you. Ask us if you want CD or DVD, full address. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, God bless.